Thank you. I'm an educator. I'd like to tell you a story about one of my students. She's a bright, intelligent, motivated, articulate individual. She took herself out of a terribly abusive relationship, leaving with little more than the blouse on her bruised back and her infant daughter in her arms. She realized that if she was going to be successful for herself and her daughter, she would have to advance her education beyond her high school. And she did just that. She completed an undergraduate degree and a certification as a chartered accountant. In her final work term towards her CA, she was advised by senior executives in the CA firm that if she was to complete an MBA, a master's degree in business administration, they would guarantee her employment. That's how impressed they were with her work ethic. How could she go wrong with a guarantee like that? So she completed her MBA, and upon graduation, was offered and did accept employment with this prestigious accounting firm. Upon graduation, she also realized that she had amassed a student debt larger than the mortgage that I held on my home. She also realized that she'd probably be in her late 40s, perhaps even early 50s, before she would qualify for a mortgage. It would take her that long to pay down her student debt, not pay it off, pay down her student debt, and save sufficient for a down payment. She had become shackled to the oar on the ship of debt. She had become indentured as much as individuals were indentured 150, 200 years ago, when perhaps in old Europe they looked at North America and saw a land of opportunity but couldn't afford the passage. So landowners paid their passage and they became servants, indentured servants for the rest of their lives. But they did so willingly for the benefit and the freedom of their children. My student, indentured, have we not learned anything in 150, 200 years? So what went wrong? She had done everything right. She took herself out of that terribly abusive relationship. She had advanced her education. She was a productive member of society. And who should care anyway whether she has debt? Should you care? How about you? Up in the balcony, should any of you care? Should I care? When a segment of our society is indentured in financial servitude, governance and security as a unitary concept is threatened and our democracy is challenged. And that's why that is unacceptable. And when a further segment of our society doesn't even qualify for student loan to advance their education, our governance and security and democracy are further challenged. Democracy, true democracy, is about freedom. And when freedom is eroded, our democracy is eroded. And that's why you and you and you up in the balcony and I must care. So where can we potentially find a solution? Let's take a look at some of the stakeholders. We have the government, the federal government, Minister of Finance. He takes a look at the financial situation in the global village, only has to look at 2008 to realize that you and I are vulnerable. So they take action to mitigate that vulnerability. Is there not merit in that? One area that they look at is in mortgages. Reduce the term, increase the mortgage. As a result, you and I are less vulnerable. A second stakeholder, banks. Banks provide loans. Banks provide student loans. You'd like a loan to buy a new car, you go to the bank. The bank assesses your risk. If you have other assets, other savings, the bank assesses you as low risk. There's an increased probability that you will receive a loan. 
Students tend not to have assets. They tend not to have savings. If they did, they probably wouldn't be applying for a student loan. Banks look at students, see high risk, low probability of a loan on face value. So government takes action. Today, if a student declares personal bankruptcy, they still have to pay back their student loan. Banks look at that assurance, see a lower risk, increase the probability that they will provide a loan to some students. Is there not merit in that? A third stakeholder, academic institutions, colleges, universities, they provide education, they provide degrees, diplomas. Is there not merit in that? Our fourth stakeholder, our students, my student, sees a future in education. Is there not merit in that? With all this merit, where might we find a solution? The solution is in integrity, that ability to steadfastly adhere to moral standards. And moral standards and moral decisions are individual. Ethics are societal. So all our stakeholders can stand up and say, what I'm doing has merit. If there is a problem, it must be somebody else's problem. My decisions are moral. Therein lies the problem. Because they are acting as individuals. They're not behaving as a collective for the betterment of society. So how do we get them to move? That comes down to moral will and moral skill, as noted by Barry Schwartz in another TED Talk. Moral will is just that, the motivation for you and I to get up off our butts and make the right decision. And the right decision isn't necessarily following a policy, a procedure, a rule, a regulation, an act, or a statute. We all know too well that the law can be an ass. Moral skill is just that. The skill, the knowledge to achieve the objective. Moral will and moral skill. There is a need to create a future of learning that focuses on freedom. Freedom from financial slavery. But academic institutions are businesses. They have a bottom line. I run my own business. Anybody who runs their business knows the importance of monitoring profit and loss statements. But should education be reduced to a line item on a financial statement? Or should it be about enabling knowledge creation, engaging in those conversations that matter? TED is about engaging in those conversations that matter. TED is about ideas, the power of ideas to bring about change in attitudes and behaviors. My quest is to engage in those conversations that matter about how we finance education. My quest is to unshackle students, unshackle my student from the oar on the ship of debt in this indentured fleet. And you can take action today. Here at TED, you can start to engage in those conversations that matter. You can do research. You can find out what's happening in other jurisdictions, MOOCs as an example, massive open online courses, or a model that I like, the Australian model that's been duplicated in many other countries, and I believe can be used here very successfully. Never before in the history of humankind have so many people held in the palm of their hand the power to bring about change. Today you are members of a new tribe. It's called TEDx Victoria. Imagine if all of you today, here now, were to text the Minister of Advanced Education and respectfully request that the Minister engage in conversations with you about how we can refinance education. You're members of other tribes, your home tribe, your work tribe, your leisure tribe, your social tribe. Imagine if those people did the same thing. Imagine the change that we could bring about. 
My quest, ladies and gentlemen, is motivated by my student. Will you join me in this quest? Thank you.